Welcome back to another episode of the Experts in Fire podcast. I'm your host, Mike Venard, and with me today is Randy Mowry. Today's episode is what to consider before purchasing a patio heater. Let's get into it. Today's episode is brought to you by the Flamecraft Tondo Gas Fire Pit. The Tondo features a two-piece interlocking design that's easy to assemble and light enough to ship ground. With 36 possible color combinations, it's easy to customize the Tondo to match your style. Go with a solid color scheme or mix and match your favorite shades for a two-tone look. The Tondo's powerful stainless steel with brass jet burner system also creates maximum flames while using half the fuel of standard burners. Build your Tondo today by visiting www.woodlandrec.com or call 800-919-1904 to talk to an NFI certified expert. Hey Randy, how you doing brother? I am doing great. How are you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm awesome, brother. I'm awesome. I'm enjoying the uh, the the snow outside my window. No, I'm not. I'm yeah, kidding. I'm um, totally kidding. There's a lot out there. <laughs> it's cold, and there's a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, but the best part is the future draws nigh. Spring is upon us. The end of February is here. I'm flying to Jamaica. The uh, the sun for a week, and then when I come back, my expectation is. It'll just be warm here. (laughs) So in this episode, we're going to talk about what to consider when choosing a patio heater. And uh, you and I have been talking a little beforehand here, and there's just different versions of patio heaters and different things that people need to consider. So uh, jump us in. What should we consider when choosing a patio heater? Yeah, great product to talk about right now. We do a lot of patio heaters. And the first thing that we want to always consider is the space itself that the patio heater will be used in. First, is it residential? Is it commercial? Is it a wide open area, meaning somebody has a pergola out maybe in their backyard someplace? Or is it an open patio with a roof? Or is it a fully enclosed patio, meaning that has screens and windows? You know, so there is a lot to consider. And the first thing is obviously the, the placement. Where is it going? Let's throw a couple scenarios out there for folks. Because COVID hit and everything moved outside, we've answered a million of these questions as people have called uh, just to talk about patio heaters. And, you know, you mentioned pergolas outside, hanging them from pergolas. You mentioned uh, enclosed spaces. You mentioned uh, semi-enclosed spaces. I think we can kind of stick to those three types of areas when we talk about this. So in those three areas, what things should we be thinking about? I mean, are there differences between patio heaters? Is there something that we should be considering? Sure. And it's a good question. First, really, you have two types, gas and electric, um, natural gas and propane for the gas-fueled fire pits, or I'm sorry, patio heaters, uh, and then our electric patio heaters. So when we're talking spaces, let's use like an open space, meaning we can go back to like the pergola, for example. That's something that you could easily use a, you know, natural gas, propane, or electric patio heater in. And before I get into that part of it, within each category, Mike, too, we want to consider what someone is looking for. Because not only do you have the, the natural gas, propane, electric, the heaters themselves are available as a freestanding heater, which a lot of people will see like standing in the middle of walkways, going into restaurants and things of that nature. And those are going to be gas. You know, typically those are self-contained propane tank style. You have ceiling hanging gas patio heaters. So sometimes you might see those where somebody, a restaurant has put in an overhang. It's not a full structure roof, but it has metal pipes and stuff. And they're using these gas hanging electric heaters. And then you actually have mount them to the ceiling or wall mounted. So those are your typical, as far as the the styles. And then we've talked about the, you know, the, what, what's available as far as parts. So now the space. Okay, so talking about this pergola area. Yeah, because the, the, the space itself. Pergolas are f- fully wide open spaces. And, and if it's wide open like a pergola, you can use a freestanding, you know, propane style heater. The consideration is always going to be 
I'm going to say this now for, for each and every application is going to be, we want to talk clearances, clearances to combustibles. We want to make sure that these spaces have the correct height and meet all of the clearances for, and, and, and this goes for whether, Mike, whether it's electric gas or either application, but for freestanding pergola, you can easily use a gas patio heater in an application like that if it meets the clearances above it. Electric heaters are a little bit more challenging sometimes for somebody that may have a pergola like in the middle of their yard because maybe that doesn't make sense because you got to run electric out there. Uh, any thought on the open space before I move on at all, Mike? We've broken it down into three spaces, your wide open space, your semi-enclosed space, and then your enclosed space, right? And now you've broken it down into the types of of patio heaters as well. Number one being how the heat is created, either gas or electric, right? And then the opportunity for um, freestanding, which have 20 pound propane tanks that are working with them. And then the other ones, they're all either gonna be hard pipe gas or wired electrical. So sticking with the freestanding gas unit, partially enclosed. Partially enclosed, meaning somebody builds a, a patio area, they put a roof on it, and then maybe they put one wall or two walls fully open to the outside. But what I mean fully open, I mean no screens, no windows. Fully open space, okay? So, yeah, yeah, you could use a standing patio heater in that application if it meets the clearances for all of your elements with inside of that space, okay? Meaning above it, a mushroom heater. You know, you don't want that heater eight inches away from a TV if you have it mounted on the wall. Real, real important. So you could still use it in, in, in an instance where you have possibly, you know, one or two fully open walls. You have to read the owner's manual and follow the specifications of the manufacturer on that. Now, moving into a, a Four Seasons room, Florida room, no, you are not going to use a freestanding gas patio heater in there. Now it becomes... You have to ask yourself, Mike, would I put this patio heater in my living room? No. Well, a Four Seasons room and or a Florida room that has glass windows on it and screens, that instantly really becomes a confined space. So you're not going to use that type of patio heater in an application like that. And it, let's let's clarify real fast, Randy, because you said you got to ask the question, would I put this in my living room? And then you quickly answered it, no. For anyone out there who was wondering, you should answer that question, no. No. <laughs> you are not going to put that in your living room. And you capital should Capital N, capital O. <laughs> no, no, no. That is not what you're going to do. You have fire-related questions, and we have answers. You can email us your questions at podcast at woodlanddirect.com or give us a call at 586-221-3638. We would love to be able to answer them right here on the Experts in Fire podcast. We're going to stick with gas. We'll move to electrics independently. So now we're going into the gas mounted versions, okay? And, and like you mentioned, Mike, the gas mounted versions, whether it's ceiling mounted, wall mounted, these are going to be hard pipe. You know, we're, we're not operating these on like little barbecue 20 pound propane tanks anymore. We're talking hard pipe propane or hard pipe natural gas to each individual patio heater where it's going to be placed. And outdoor space, you know, like a pergola, yes, you could put it in a space like that. Most of your manufacturers, and you're going to have to read, you know, I'm always going to refer to the manuals on these from the manufacturers because they're going to be a little bit different per manufacturer. I can't stress that enough to folks. That manufacturer may require you to have some type of covering on it to be able to protect it from the elements. Just as a heads up for folks, you want to make sure that you ask the question because we're always going to ask the question to you, is this going to have some type of protection or roof over top of it? Okay. So it can be used in like in a pergola application, a wide open application, maybe with some protection, covering it by the manufacturer. So we'll have to get there based on the application. Now moving into a patio with a roof. And this is going to be typical for homes and, and going back to restaurants because we do a lot of commercial properties, Mike. So these are open areas. They, they have a roof on them. And the gas units can be used in there if it meets like the air exchange requirement. And that's going back to the manuals, going back to having these open walls, 
partially open maybe on one wall, but we have to get that information from the client to make sure that it's going to be safe for folks. Making sure you meet the clearances on the heights because the gas, you know, the gas heaters, even if you're ceiling or wall mounted, they are going to have a certain clearance to combustibles that has to be met across the top, a left and the right, and also the bottom. A heater from the floor to the bottom of a gas heater, it may need to be eight feet. Then you have your heater head that is another 13, 14 inches. And then maybe you need another 13, 14 inches above that. You can see we're getting to like over 10 feet almost. There's a lot that goes into these clearances for safety reasons. Can't stress the safety about these enough, Mike. Going into just like the Four Seasons Florida room, you're not going to use these gas heaters in a space like that. Once again, no. It's like putting it in your living room. No, we're not doing that. I was going to ask you that because, um, you know, we're, we're talking, we're, we're sticking with the gas side um, for right now, but we are going to move into the yes with a capital Y E S. I don't want folks to feel like we're saying no, we cannot. <laughs> right. There is a yes, and, and Randy will get to that. But I, I, I feel like you've kind of opened the can up a little bit here for us to say, yeah, we probably should talk about how gas heats a space and how electric heats a space. Just like these gas units, when you go into a facility, you're going to notice that they're heating the airspace, the space within where you're sitting at. So it's real important, the placement-wise. So sometimes you may need possibly more gas units, but that comes into us helping a client figure out the square footage of what they're trying to heat, the placement of you know, where they're putting things at. If they have a dead space of 20 by 20 foot area, they may not care. They may not need heat in that direction. So we want to make sure we're putting those gas units towards the folks that are going to be sitting out there. Um, but yeah, we're, he we're heating the airspace with those gas units, which is really, you know, which is really nice. Excellent. So in terms of gas, we're looking at, there are particular rules to it. And then I'm hearing you say as well that depending on the size of the space is going to determine how many heaters are needed. Is that something we can help people with as well? Correct. For example, your dome style heaters cover 11 foot by 11 foot, 10 foot by 10 foot. You want to always check with the manufacturer. They may say 100 square feet. They may say 110, 120 um, they are going to vary a little bit. So you think about it as a footprint, Mike, when you're looking at like, so if you're, if you're at your house, you know, just take a measurement of the deck, you know, it's like, you know, oh, okay, my deck is 13 by 15, but I, it's wide open. I can only use a dome heater. And you, you know, you might want two, putting one in each corner because they are subject to air. As the wind passes, it's going to move the, the heat around, things of that nature. That's why when you go to some of these restaurants that, um, are open like that. That's why you see so many of them. One of the local pubs around here, I bet you he has 20 heaters of these stand-ups because that's all he has. I bet he has 20 of these things in a small space. Basically, he's got one for every table almost. And so he's trying to maximize that area with a gas unit. Everything's based on footprint. You know, a ceiling mount heater, they may have a little bit better footprint because they're up high. A gas ceiling mount heater, it may have a footprint of 150 square feet. It depends on the model. We're going to help guide our clients to the correct model that is going to maximize the footprint of what they're trying to accomplish with the heater. That's gas. Are we ready to move toward electric? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so again, we've got multiple areas, right? We've got the fully enclosed, the partially enclosed, and then the complete open air space like a pergola space. How would an electric unit differ from the gas? And there are, there are pluses and minuses, and I wanna make sure everybody knows out there, we have an answer for everything. There's gonna be pluses and minuses for each of these because you're trying to heat a space unlike a house that's completely wrapped, especially nowadays you buy a new house, they have these things sealed so tight. I'm trying to heat the outdoors. Exactly. When it's 50, 60 degrees, <laughs> right? So it, exactly. Th there are tricks to each of these and how you use them and why you use them. So let's move to uh, the electric side of things so that we can talk to uh, exactly what you talk to with the gas. No, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Electric heaters are fantastic. Because electric heaters, I'll say it like this first, 
everything that we've talked about with gas in the, the no, you can't do this, the yes, electric heaters can meet and go into any of these applications. Okay. So it doesn't matter what your application of a, se a four seasons room, partially open, wide open, it, it doesn't matter. The electric versions can be used in any of these applications. Now we get into where are you using it? What are you trying to accomplish? I'm going to start with the 110 volt three prong plug. You plug your lamp into your nightstand next to your bed. Okay. They do make 110 volts. Usually they're going to be like a, what we call a thousand watt, 1500 watt unit. If we talk about footprint, like we were talking about the, the envelope of heat, generally you're going to find that those are going to be like a four foot by four foot, five foot by five foot of coverage. Okay. Now this type of heater is Typically, I'll put it this way. So typically, if I'm using a 110 volt heater, it's because somebody maybe has a, a per an enclosed pergola with a jacuzzi in it. And then they have a step out room where people get dressed. And maybe they just want a small little heater there to put some heat down on them while they're because it's, you know, it's Michigan, it's 20 degrees outside eight inches of snow. I don't want to be freezing the second I will, you know, so they might want just a small heater there or they have a four seasons room, one chair, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa goes out there to read for, you know, a little while and they just want to put some heat on themselves for a little bit. Or maybe it's an indoor bathroom using the jacuzzi pergola scenario. People are tired of coming out of their shower and being frozen to death. The little, you know, 110 volt heater could be application. You could use it in a bathroom as well. They're small areas for a little bit of heat for some, you know, for a, maybe a single person, it's not going to heat up a whole space. We do a lot of them and there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're great units. My office is in my basement. It's always cold and it's a Michigan basement. So applications like that, these are perfect for that. Gas is heating up the space. It's trying to heat up the air in that space. It sounds to me like you're saying the electric are heating objects in that space. You got it, my friend. You got it. You got it. Man, <laughs> Was that a leading question? Yeah, you're <laughs> awesome, man. We're going to stick with infrared heaters, which is what we primarily sell, probably 95 or better percent. Uh, infrared heat is different than like your uh, heat coming off your dome style mushroom gas. So infrared is direct heat. It is, you're heating the objects in the space. So if I'm sitting in my basement and I have this electric heater above me, it's heating me. It's not heating the airspace around me. It's heating me. So the moment I get up and I step out of that envelope of, we're going to use a, we're going to use 110 volt, 1500 watt heater, five foot by five foot envelope, just for people that are listening. I step out, I get out of my chair and I step out of that five foot area. I don't feel any of that. I don't feel anything. How it works as far as object heating and infrared heat is think of a summer day. You are standing in the burning sun and there is a huge oak tree, shaded tree next to you. And you and go and step under that, under that shaded oak tree. And you all of a sudden you feel that huge temperature differential. That's how the infrared heat works is we're heating the objects with inside the space. And the, Mike, this is going to be for everything from the small 1500 watt all the way to a 6,000 watt. The heater function as far as object heating is the exact same. Our footprint just gets bigger as we go up in wattage. Yes. The example you use, and I think it's the best way for folks to think about it. And that's really what these electric heaters are. They're that, they're that sun that is heating you when you step out of that you're back to ambient air temperature and that's a part of what our gas heaters are trying to do is help increase that ambient air temperature versus the electrics are just heating whatever they're pointing at garages no gas if you're in a garage you're going to buy a a specific gas heater not a patio heater. They are different. They're very specific. But however, um, as we move forward, we're going to jump into 240 volt systems now. And you're going to go 240 volt and everything from, we'll call it, you know, 3000 watt to 6000 watt. First thing you'll probably notice is, is obviously the wattage goes up. Okay. So typically when you get into a 3000 watt heater, you're going to be going into 240 volt. 240 volt power is obviously not something that everybody has in their home. Okay, this is going to require an electrician to come out. 
first, they're going to have to do an evaluation of your power usage at your electrical panel to see if you even have enough power to do what you're thinking of doing. And with the initial phone call, when folks call for heaters, we want to ask them first, we're going to find out the space as we talked about. And if they're going to go to electric, we're going to talk about the space, give us some information on the footprint. We'll make our recommendations and, and then we'll provide those here. This is what you need, how many, the wattage and the amps that are required for that particular heater so that they can get that to the electrician to see if they have enough power first, Mike, because we don't want folks wasting their time buying product because we mention all the time, we see these cool things on Instagram and all this other kind of stuff. And it's only as cool as if you can actually apply it. And it, it's a part of what to consider, right? As we walk through these podcasts, that's what we're trying to help people with. You see these pictures on Instagram and on Pinterest. And, you know, I'll, I'll just go to Google at times and uh, uh, type something in and go to the images just to get ideas. They're all awesome ideas. Absolutely. But you are limited to whatever you're limited to, right? Unless you're willing to say, hey, I'll bring in a whole new gas line or you know, I'm going to uh, pull more power, I'll work with the electric company. That's great. But knowing what you have and what you need are two very important things. And that's, that's really what we're trying to walk through for folks as we walk through these types of episodes. You know, I just had my box changed out a couple years ago. I have plenty of power. I can run that 240. Can I daisy chain these? How many can 3,000, 6,000 watt system? How does that work? No, so when it comes to the patio heaters, the 240 volt heaters, they're independently wired. And with the electric 240 volt heaters, I'm just gonna jump up into like, a, I'm gonna use 6,000 watt heaters. It is the largest size. When you go to 240 volt, the questions are always, what do you wanna accomplish with a patio heater? Do you just, are you putting an eight foot table in the middle of your patio and that's all you care about? Or are you trying to maximize every square inch of that space? If you just want to cover that table and the people around the table, and we're going to be able to mount it straight overhead, that's the difference of putting one or two heaters in versus maximizing a space and putting four heaters in to be able to cover every square inch of it. Because maybe you have a high top bar table and you want everybody that is in that area to be comfortable. We're just going to use a scenario of one heater. A 6,000 watt heater is going to have what they call two elements inside of it. Because I have two elements, yes, I can run one power line to the heater, but then what's going to happen is when you turn it on, you're going to turn on both heating elements at a time, meaning you're going to be operating at 6,000 watts at all times. Depending on the manufacturer, you might have an option for a remote control. You're going to turn that on and you're going to turn it on at 6,000 watts all at one time. That wireless handheld remote control is going to be just on and off. If you put it on a light switch on the wall, that switch is just going to be on and off, 6,000 watts. Now, some of our manufacturers may have what they call like a uh, like an intermittent or control. Lack of better terms, think of a think of a dimmer control type of control that you have for a dimmer light in your house. That's going to control both elements at one time, possibly. You know, so it just depends on the manufacturer, depends on the heat. But the great thing about a heater that has two elements is this: the electrician can wire each element independently, Mike. So he can put two light switches on the wall. So let's just say that it's a, it's a little bit warmer. You don't need all 6,000. You flip one switch and you can turn one element on. It gives you that 50%, 100% adjustability using the switch on and off. Um, that's what's nice about a dual element style of heater. It gives you a bit more versatility when you go into a 240 volt dual element style of heater. You're maximizing the coverage. A 6,000 watt is going to cover almost a 13 by 13 foot footprint mounted directly overhead. Okay, so use the example of a 20 by 20 patio, you know, which is a decent sized patio. It's not the biggest, it's not the smallest, but you got a 20 by 20 patio. If you put one 6,000 watt right in the middle of that, you would be warming a 12 by 12 space on that. Correct, exactly. So that would be 20 by 20, one heater is a perfect example of only worrying about one central location. If they were trying to maximize that space, this is where we would want to get into two of them. Now, are we mounting both of those on the wall? Are we going to be able to mount them on the ceiling? What direction? Because mounting is really important. You know, if I mount it on a wall and I'm turning that thing at a 45 degree angle, you want to make sure that that 13 by 13 footprint is covering all the space that you want. 
So that's where coverage really becomes important in how they're going to be mounted. For example, we can use the same 20 by 20, but 20 by 20 that is opened on three sides. So we have an old farmhouse. The house itself is our mounting point because across the front is all open to the beautiful backyard area of this patio. They may want to put two on the home and two up towards the soffit area on the outside pointing in to maximize that coverage. You see what I mean? So it depends on exactly what they're trying to cover up. But there again, in an application like that, we may be able to step down to a 4,000 watt heater instead of a 6,000. We're using 6,000 watt units now. It's the largest of all the units. That's why coverage is so important and what folks are looking to achieve from the heater. What are we trying to cover? What are we trying to heat up? You know, what are our concerns? You know, I have a lot of folks that will say, okay, well, you know what? I have a 20 foot by 20 foot area, but I just put in a fireplace on one end with a solid wall. I, I don't care about that area because the fireplace is going to cover the people sitting in that area. I'm only worried about like the other 10 by 10, but the aesthetics are important for folks as well because they may want like the symmetry, the illusion. They may overkill a little bit and put two, three or 4,000 watt heaters in that 10 foot by 10 foot area just from an aesthetic standpoint, because it looks good. These are all questions, Mike, that we get involved with, with asking clients. And I know it's a lot. I, I know it's, a, I, I, I mean, I rabbit trailed off your question big time on that. <laughs> it's funny because most people, you know, they consider the mushroom heater and they go, well, I'll just throw a couple in the pergola and there are so many things to consider when as soon as you make that statement especially if you go to restaurants which you know most people are running to restaurants and you'll see these heaters mounted up in a corner or mounted in a space where you go wow that's i loved it what a great experience sitting at that restaurant getting to be outside yet not freezing it's it's an idea that people get and what we want to do is help people understand there are a lot of things to consider but don't don't get overwhelmed really if you call one of our pros and they would be able to talk through your scenario, what you have going on. And if you call us, one of the first questions we're going to ask you is tell us about your project. And we get so many people who they'll they'll dive right into this is what I want. And we'll try to bring them back around to say, tell us about your project, because your project is going to be the thing that determines what you're able to use. Uh, and you can see in this scenario Super important. I've been at Woodland for over 12 years. How many conversations go a different way because of that one question of tell me about your project? I always encourage folks to just call us because that's the, the safety part of any application is the most important for us. 100%. So in this scenario, we have gas available. However, when I think about my own home, I begin to think about, okay, I'm limited in the amount of gas I can run without getting another tap into that gas main. And then I have an electrical box that I have to consider as well to go, okay, if I'm pulling 240 off of that, it, there's just math that needs to be done. And that's where, again, we reach out to our pros. Guys, don't try to do this on your own. If you're if you're a homeowner, DIY in this thing, you really need pros out there who can tell you exactly what you're going to need and be able to run it for you. And then to our pros out there, lean on us. When it comes to daisy chaining, and Randy went through 6,000 watts versus 3,000, 4,000, you know, how, what do you want to do? We also work with manufacturers who offer the ability to to say, here's the space, let us put together the perfect scenario for you with the number of heaters, the wattage you're going to need, the entire bit. So we can help you with your quotes, we can help you with designing that space so you can go back to your homeowner and say, here, this is going to give you what you want for heating your space. Lean on us for all that stuff because we can we can do that for you. It's always frustrating for someone who has their heart set because they've done their research and they have their heart set on something specific and then we have to tell them, no, you can't do that. But if you, instead, if you approach the project with, I just want to heat this space, how do I go about doing that? Reach out. 
and we'll walk you to that product that's I, I've discovered if you walk through the process that way, you're going to be excited about what you end at. If you walk through it kind of, I'm going to do my own self-discovery and look, I found the perfect thing just to be told, no, nah, that's not going to work. There's heartache there. It doesn't matter. We yeah. all do it, man. We all do it. Yeah, I hear you right there with you. So if you have questions about this, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to answer them. If you are listening to this podcast and you're saying, wow, they missed some things, we know. And just the yeah, raw we footage, I, we, we've done way too many minutes. And, and our producer is sitting there right now going, you guys have talked way too much. It's, it's not viable for a good podcast to be talking this long. There's so much to go through that people don't consider. So please reach out to us. Thank you all for listening. We really do appreciate it. And Randy, thank you, brother, for spending the time. I, I'm watching you as we're talking, and you're like trying to control yourself because there's yes. so much. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Uh, no, I love it. I love it. Everybody out there, have a safe and happy day. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time for What to Know When Choosing a Gas Barbecue Grill. We'll see you then.